thank you to everybody um, who has joined us on a Monday morning. Thank you for your enthusiasm for joining us today. Uh, my name is Talia Koub. I'm a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and I had the opportunity to be part of the Post-Covid-19 Futures Commission co-chairing the Public Debate and Participation Working Group. Uh, I have the pleasure of um, uh, introducing a little bit about the report itself and then introducing the um, panel. Um, just to note that um, we had um, Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef on, and I think we just lost him. And he was um, he was getting on with another. Oh. There we go. That's great. Thank you very much, Hamza. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the report, and then I'll introduce the excellent panel that we have. So, um, at the start of the pandemic. Um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh pulled together uh, people from different areas um, of uh, public life in Scotland, whether it's science, academia, business um, and beyond. Um, and the, the purpose of doing so was to identify how can we, at the time we were using language build back better, um, how can we in, ensure that Scotland is more resilient and uh, ready for a future crisis? And what can we learn from the one that we are currently still going through? Um, the position of the RSE was to be as positive as possible, learn what we can and do better next. The aim was to support a better future for Scotland and to build a fairer, more resilient society through addressing immediate challenges and longer term policy and practice questions. It was also an opportunity to learn important lessons about our current processes and institutions that are informed by evidence, expertise and public dialogue. Um, unlike a lot of work that has happened in this area, the Royal Society of Edinburgh tried really hard to engage in new and innovative ways with a wider range of people than simply the, those who are, were asked to be on the working groups. Um, so we explored four key areas and different working groups were set up for this, which were how to build national resilience, improving public debate and participation in decision making, the use of data, evidence and science, and delivering inclusive public services. The report was launched um, not so long ago, just in October, and um, some of the key recommendations include forming a national participation strategy and centre for Scotland to allow more people to be engaged and have power and ownership over the decisions, policies um, and systems that are developed within Scotland. Creating a national foresighting centre to better prepare us for future crises. Establishing a fully independent fact checking service to tackle the um, spread, significant spread of misinformation. <laughs> transforming how we deliver public service, particularly around social prescribing and in community delivery. The entire report is available on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's dedicated website on the COVID-19 Futures Commission. Um, we will be asking you questions, although I reserve um, some questions for myself as chair, but please use the chat function and the Q&A um, as we go through this, and I will I try and um, get as many questions as possible answered. But to very briefly introduce our panel, we have Professor Neve McDeed. Neve is a director of the award-winning award Leverhulme Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science. She was um, the chair and commissioner of the Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission on Data, Evidence and Science. We have Professor Stephen Ricker. Stephen is a member of the SAGE subcommittee advising on behavioural science. He's a professor of psychology at the University of St Andrews and a fellow of the RSE. He was a member of the Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission Working Group on Data, Evidence and Science. And we have Hamza Youssef, MSP, who was appointed as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care in May 2021. I'd like to invite them all to give their kind of introductory remarks on the report um, and um, the Cabinet Secretary's re reflections on the report. And I'll start with Neve. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Talaton. Good morning, everybody, uh, both my fellow panellists and also everybody who's um, joining us online. Um, I had the real privilege of, reading, of leading um, a group uh, that were looking at data evidence um, and science in its wider context. And really, I suppose the critical things that came out um, very clearly from how we both went about our business, but also the information that emerged from the different interactions that we had, is that Without data and good quality data, we can't generate to a large extent evidence and without data and evidence, we can't really um, deal with some of the scientific challenges that COVID-19 um, uh, presented to us and indeed we're in, in the middle of a new uh, challenge just now. Um, the importance then of looking at what do we mean by data, what do, where are our comfort zones 
around the uh, delivery or the giving away of our data uh, to both public services and other services? Um, and what's the responsibility that we're placing upon them when we give our data uh, freely? Um, and as I said, without that data, that data enables us then to derive evidence, whether that's from scientific testing or whether it's from other means. We had some fantastic conversations, um, particularly with uh, young adults and young people, um, speaking to them really frankly um, about what all of this means for them. And of course, we come, um, I come with middle aged baggage. So it's it's listening to those young voices. Um, because they're the future generation of our country. Um, that was really, really insightful and really interesting. We equally had some very, I think, powerful conversations with the media um, and with policymakers, where we were speaking, again, very frankly, um, about uh, what, what, are, what are they seeking when they're interviewing scientists or when they're speaking to scientists or when they're speaking to people who are attempting to provide them with data, data that enables them to either communicate or to make policy decisions. So um, uh, to, to cut it short, that those conversations were really illuminating. Um, they enabled us to pull together the, the, the major strands of um, uh, our recommendations, which was a national conversation about data, evidence and science, which was a fact checking service so that we can separate facts from opinions and uh, looking at the establishment of curricula for science in schools and also science communication for those communicators, communication catalysts, the media and the policymakers. Thank you so much, Neve. Stephen, can I come to you? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I, uh, 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 as Talit said, I'm, I'm, I'm a social psychologist at the University of St Andrews uh, and became involved in the uh, in the various advisory groups, both in, in the UK and in Scotland around COVID. And it really was um, uh, a voyage of discovery for me, um, since I'd never been involved in such things before. And so the discussions we had within the data evidence uh, group, I was I was one of uh, Neve's worker ants um, uh, in, 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 in the group, um, uh, was fascinating and raised, I mean, I think three key issues. I mean, the first key issue, I think, for me was that of logistics. So uh, as an academic, normally, if you ask me a question, I say to you, well, I'll work on a research proposal, I'll do the research, I'll publish it, and I'll give you an answer in five years' time. Um, and the policymaker looks at you and says, no, next Tuesday. Um, and so just th those questions of how do you produce data quickly that isn't too dirty, that balance between speed and uh, making sure that things are reliable. Because of course, science is never a final word. It always moves on, but you've got to give people confidence when you when you make statements that they're reasonably well backed up. So that, that, that whole question of logistics and the different pace of government and of academia um, uh, confronted me in a way I've never really thought about it before. The second thing is, I mean, I think one of the things that's been done well in Scotland and one of the things that's been understood is the centrality of trust. The issue of whether people adhere or not isn't a question so much of, um, you know, are they clever, are they less clever? It's much more to do with whether they trust the sources of information. So how do we build trust? Um, how do we get people to be willing to take the evidence we say seriously and also trust our evidence over and above that which they come across from the anti-vaxxers um, you know, on social media and so on. And I think that's a real challenge to us because I think issues like transparency are central um, uh, to trust. I think issues like um, we, we actually have to begin to think about the nature of our institutions because if our institutions are seen as exclusive, as places which ordinary where ordinary people don't have a place, they're less likely to trust those um, who work within them. We've got to learn to be better as communicators. And there's almost been a sense within academia right, that horribly um, snobbish sense that you know, if, if you communicate properly and popularly, you're not really an academic. Real academics are so clever that nobody can understand them. So again, I think we've got to challenge um, those views. And the third thing is to get to understand the media. As Neve was saying, some of the most fascinating um, uh, debates were debates with the media. Because, for instance, the media has its own values. 
um, it loves bad news. Um, one of the things that I, I kept wittering on about when I was in the media was, um, you know, they far prefer somebody, for instance, breaking uh, restrictions, breaking the rules, and people doing the dull thing and staying at home and watching the telly. So that leads you to overestimate the number of people who aren't complying. And if you overestimate the number of people who aren't complying, you begin to say, why should I do so myself? So really big questions and really interesting questions and not something where we're the great experts and we can give you the answer. In this, as in so much else, it's got to be a conversation and we've got so much to learn. And I feel I've learned a huge amount in this process and I'm very grateful for those who've helped me learn. Thank you so much, Stephen. Lots to digest there. Um, I've just noticed that we've lost uh, Neve. Thankfully, she's done her introduction, but that's the perils of being online and live. But for now, we will move on to Cabinet Secretary Yamziza for your reflections on the report. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Talit. And, and look, thanks, first of all, for bringing everybody uh, together. I admire uh, everybody uh, on this call, yourself included, uh, Chair, but Professor Riker and, and, and Professor Nick Dade. And um, although I've had some conversations with Professor Riker first time, I've had the chance to, to have a conversation or be on a panel with um, Professor McDade. So although she's uh, disappeared, I won't take it as a personal insult uh, 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 as yet, but uh, I look forward to the discussion that will uh, ensue. Uh, and secondly, let me say I'm pleased that we've got a, a number of people uh, online and, and, and watching uh, on what I know will be a busy uh, Monday uh, for, 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 for everybody, uh, no doubt. I'm really, again, taken by what um, uh, my two previous panel uh, members uh, have said. Um, and I think for me, a, a few reflections, if I may, on, on your report, but also on some of the broader themes that have been uh, discussed on, 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 on the report itself uh, that has been produced by the Royal uh, Society. I think you hit on some of the really key, key issues for our preparedness for future uh, crises or pandemics uh, or, or, or those, uh, frankly, events that will call, that will really challenge our resilience as a country. But actually, we'd be really daft not to embed some of what you're suggesting now for the current pandemic, because I'm afraid, as everybody knows, and I suppose the emergence of the, the, the a new variant of concern confirms we're nowhere near out of this pandemic, or certainly not out of this pandemic in, in, in the immediate future. And so, what I'm really keen to capitalise on in terms of what the report has said, and then we've got a, a, a fair bit of work to do within this in government, is the public participation being key to our decision making. For me, you know, again, and I've been a government minister for the best part of nine years and one, two, three, four different roles now. So different roles and, you know, they've all been incredibly different, actually, in terms of what they've involved the best policy we ever devised uh you know policies we ever devised are those that take the public with us on the journey of what we're trying to do um and, and they can understand and see the logic of what we're trying to do and we completely fail where we don't take them if i just give one example from a previous life actually when i was justice secretary you know depended how you asked the question you know actually in scotland if you look at justice attitudes towards justice uh, we can seem quite a punitive society in one sense, uh, progressive in lots of matters, but actually in penal policy, we seem to be uh, a little bit more uh, conservative uh, with a small C, maybe even with a big C uh, at times with our justice policy. But then actually when you when, when we began to speak to people uh, and do more focus groups and, and, and engage with people, and we never really test this at national kind of assembly or national uh, assistance assembly level, we should have done actually. When we started to ask people, well, do you think people should be given a, a, an opportunity to rehabilitate? Oh, oh yeah, for sure, yeah, definitely. Do you think prison's the best place for rehabilitation? No, 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 probably not. Um, and, and so actually when you began to speak to people about what we were trying to do, you could see that they were coming with you on the journey. And, and I would go as far when I was just a secretary, you know, just even seeing that change within people who had been really harmed by, by crime. You know, victims of crime who've been really, really harmed. Uh, some even who've been bereaved by by by, by crime. But uh, so, so I think your 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 focus on public participation being key uh, has been really important for us during the pandemic. I'm not saying we've always got it right by any stretch of the imagination, uh, because we we felt we've had to make decisions at such pace. What we haven't been able to think about is how 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 do we how do we really incorporate public participation uh, in that, and and that's a, that's a point that's. Professor Riker was touching upon, and I think it's a really central point that uh, we've got to give some more thought to from a, from a government perspective. 
Um, I, I think leadership is hugely important. Um, I think when you when you when you get it wrong or you make mistakes, you know, owning up to those is really really important for public trust um, as well. We don't get everything right, um, but leadership is is hugely important. And again, uh, although I'm at a party conference, I'll I'll try to kind of veer away too much from the party politics. But I think that's probably been one of the the major differences between the Scottish government's approach and, and some within the UK government, not all, but some within the UK government, where that leadership, uh, you know, we're asking people to do things, but perhaps not not leading um, from, from from the front. Um, the, the other point, forgive me, Talek, I'm taking up too much time, but I was really, um, again, taken by the report uh, at, at, at the points around, you know, independent fact-checking um, as well, because for some unbeknownst reasons, people don't trust politicians. And, uh, you know, even academics have become, you know, really, you know, uh, th th their their independence really questioned. I mean, any academic that's probably spoken in the media uh, will on the same day be accused of being a, a, a Scottish government stooge and, 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 and at the same time, uh, you know, being accused of, uh, uh, you know, selling out to pharma companies or being on the UK government side. And you get accused of, multiple things on in, in, in one appearance um, and so how you do that that independent fact checking independent where it carries um uh the public's confidence is something again I'm, I'm, I'm interested in so in government you probably know we have a standing committee set up for future preparedness for for a pandemic uh, i'll be frank with you it's not as wide yet in scope as it needs to be it's got the you know we've got the virologists and the epidemi epidemiologists and experts in zoonotics and you know pub Public uh, uh, psychology and 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 and, 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 and behaviours, uh, but we 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 are missing a huge huge piece on on, on resilience actually uh, and, and public participation. Uh, and I won't go into the detail of resilience because I think I'm I'm already probably way over the time that you had you'd wanted me to speak. Um, but but I do think that that piece about resilience is really really important. And John Swinney, the DFM, and his role is taking some of that work forward because although uh, pandemics and future public health crises are focused on public health, understandably so, uh, we clearly know from this pandemic the effects are across society, and uh, therefore making sure each and every single parts of our society uh, are able to resist and, and, and be resilient to, to the to the effects of a future pandemic or indeed a future. Uh, health crisis, then, 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 then we've got to uh, do the work now um, for that. There's a lot more I could say. I won't because again, I appreciate you want us to try to keep to some time so we can take some some questions. Thank you to everyone on the panel there. Um, it is a big report and there are multiple recommendations. And when you're talking about a crisis that has affected us in so many different ways across different um, areas of our lives, there's a lot to digest and a lot to analyse and therefore many recommendations across the board. Um, I just want to remind those who are um, watching and listening that you can use the chat function or the Q&A to send us any questions. Um, but uh, naturally, as chair, I've got a little bit of power that I'm going to use. So I've got some questions already here. Um, what I'd like to ask the panel um, is how do you think we can build on the momentum to create change that comes about as a consequence of this report and the commission and the energy of, the, of um, building back better? which we had more energy for and there was more conversation about at the beginning of the pandemic but less of it has come in now and we see a lot of us returning to normal when normal wasn't working for a lot of people so how can we build on the momentum to create change uh, from this report and what we experienced um, at the beginning of the pandemic um, Stephen can I come to you first mm. I always hate it when people ask me to have a crystal ball. And one of the reasons why I hate it is that the assumption is that things happen of themselves. Um, and actually, things only happen if people work for them and if people fight for them. And if you say they're bound to happen, often you demobilize people because they think it's inevitable. So predictions can have the perverse consequence of making things less likely because they make people more uh, passive. So I, I, I don't want to say what will happen. I want to speak a little bit more about what we need to do and what we need to learn. Because in many ways, I think that um, you know, the pandemic has been a little bit like a barium meal. It's revealed things about our society. And some of them are good, but not all of them are good. And I think one of them is that it is revealed with, with huge clarity um, the nature of inequalities in this society. The fact that 
Um, you're more likely to get ill if you're more exposed. You're more likely to be exposed if you are less privileged, whether that's a function of social class, whether it's a function of ethnicity, whether it's a function of gender, and so on and so forth. And therefore, I think one of the things I think is absolutely critical is to acknowledge um, those inequalities and put those issues of inequality at the very, very centre of what we do and never forget that uh, and work for that in every single way. That, that's the first thing I think we need to put on uh, the agenda. And I think, I mean, again, I think that has been recognised. So let me take one inequality, which we often don't talk about enough. I think that's generational inequality. Um, in the media, young people have often been demonized. We've been told that you know young people are out partying, they're out raving, and they're the problem. Actually, almost the reverse is true. First of all, young people have been hit incredibly hard. And even if they are better off in terms of physical health, in terms of mental health, the statistics on mental health are so disturbing to be almost unbelievable in terms of the proportion of young people who are affected. A majority, a majority, over half of our young people are suffering psychologically. The, the percentage who've had suicidal um, uh, ideation is absolutely massive. We have a huge problem coming down the line. And what's more, if you look at um, young people's behavior, in many ways, it's been quite remarkable. Because if you're young, the likelihood of getting physical disease from going out it, and, and suffering from it is relatively low, but the cost of staying home are very high. I, I have a 17-year-old, so I'm very well aware of that. So if you thought about yourself, you might think about, well, I might as well go out. But young people haven't done that because they've been thinking communally. They've been thinking about their elderly relatives, about the community, and they've stayed in. So I think young people have done a quite magnificent job. And I think recognizing that is really important. So let me give you a contrast from a year ago, and a contrast which you may remember, um, because there was a point uh, last autumn where young people and students were being blamed for the rise in infections. And um, uh, Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson were talking about um, you know, young people uh, killing their grannies, as if they were choosing to do things that would harm their own families. They were blaming. And I still remember the press conference at which the First Minister said, look, yes, there are more infections in young people, but there are more infections in young people precisely because they are more likely to live in multi-occupancy flats, they are more likely to work in public-facing jobs, like bar jobs, and they're more likely to be on public transport. They are more likely to be exposed. So if you want to deal with that, then you deal with it by looking at the exposure, not by blaming people and telling people off and dividing us. So I think that understanding is there. I think it's there not just in terms of generational equality, but in terms of other equalities. But if there is one priority, I think, in terms of going forward to build back better, it is acknowledging those issues of inequality and making them absolutely central to all aspects of policy, including health policy. Thank you, Stephen. I'm nodding furiously. Um, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, um, can I ask you how do you think we can build on this report, build on uh, momentum and uh, go back to some of those conversations of building back better, which have been, um, well, sidelined from the chair's opinion? Yeah, look, thank, thanks for that. And, and, and I, I was the same, nodding furiously and almost to the point of whiplash with uh, what Professor Riker was saying. Though, though when he was talking about uh, young people going out raving, but actually the reverse was true. I thought he was going to start on a story about Michael Gove, but um, I'm, I'm sad you didn't, <laughs> you, you, didn't, you didn't take that opportunity. But look, a, a few things from, from 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 me that I've learned, again, I suppose, given my experience in government over, over the years, um, one thing we have to capitalise that we did as policymakers, uh, alongside our colleagues in predominantly the public sector, but absolutely in the private sector too, is that... Um, the private sector will also often say to us in government, you guys are too slow. It takes you too slow for innovation, for change. And, and they're often right. You know, in the public sector, we're not as quick as we could be when it comes to, 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 to innovation. Um, and, and actually, even just um, rapidly responding uh, to changes in society, the public sector, we can be far, far too slow. Um, and the pandemic forced us to work at a speed 
um, that we've never worked before often. And we saw some incredible ingenuity out of necessity. And I think just capturing that and making sure that you know, of course, we do our due diligence as, as you'd expect us to do, and we're spending taxpayers' money, so really important uh, to do that. But perhaps government's risk appetite needs to be a bit bigger. Um, and I remember, again, when the pandemic first hit, uh, I was Justice Secretary, and I've been talking for a while um, since, since taking on my role, actually, as Justice Secretary, I was always in favour of having mobile phones in prisons. I mean, the, the evidence was was unequivocal about how just helpful it was for keeping up familiar uh, family contact. Uh, you're less likely to, to re-offend. Um, if you keep up that family contact, it provided support to prisoners, for example, you know, if they were uh, uh, struggling with their mental health in terms of calling the Samaritans. I mean, there were so many, so many advantages from the studies that we'd seen worldwide on that. But of course, you know, pre-pandemic, it was, you know, we're going to have to pilot it. Um, that pilot's going to have to be evaluated. We're going to have to then take some time over that and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, because of the pandemic and because of lockdown, we just had to do it. And we got on and we did it. And that didn't come without some issues. We noticed in the first instance that um, there was an issue in Pullman where a lot of young people were calling 999 and getting the police to, to come up to Pullman. And, you know, we just had to deal with these issues. Um, and, and, and we've been able to, 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 to figure it out. And, and, and I suppose just that one example, and there's loads of examples. Uh, if I think about ingenuity at the beginning of the pandemic, just you know, one, one group of, of, of health workers perhaps that don't get much um, recognition is, 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 is our technicians. I mean, they, they, they you know, transformed every single bit of kit possible into a ventilator that you can imagine at the beginning of this pandemic. If you want ingenuity, you know, try to see what these guys did with, you know, as I say, every bit of hospital kit that could be, could be transformed into a ventilator, they managed to get it turned into a ventilator at a time when we thought that there may be kind of global, global supply issues. Uh, so how do we how do we make sure that we bring that same kind of laser focus um, and speed of transformative change, um, uh, you know, as we're going through the pandemic, but also post-pandemic? And then I suppose I'll say something that, that, that might sound like it's a complete contradiction to that, which is we've also got to be really upfront with people um, and honest with people about the scale of the challenge that we're facing. I get asked all the time, you know, when 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 is Mrs. McLumphy going to get her hip operation, hip replacement? And 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 I'll get asked, you know, questions like that regularly. And and you know, temptation for governments would be just to pluck a a day out, out, out the air and try to get everybody to, to work towards that. But I think uh, we've got to make sure we're being absolutely honest with people of the scale of the challenge that we're facing and how long it does take back to to use the phrase that you're using to, to, to build back better. That, yep, we should absolutely bring some pace to that where we can without a shadow of a doubt. And the Centre for, for Sustainable Delivery is a good example of that innovation. Uh, but it still is going to take a, a huge bit of time. And then, then the last point was just the one that Professor Riker made, really, which which you know, I don't need to elaborate on at all, but that how do you appeal to that that sense of community, maybe even collective identity as well uh, here in Scotland? And, and, and those kind of advertising campaigns in Scotland have that similar thread that run, run through it. And, and, and I think they've been quite effective, which is, come on, Scotland, let's pull in the same direction together for the good of the, good, good of the country. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it's it's it it's, it seems to, as I say, touch or, or tap into that. Forgive me, a uh, sense of collective identity, which seems to work. Um, but I don't need to say any more than that because uh, Professor Riker covered it in far uh, greater expertise than, than I possibly could. But I think it's a really important uh, point to, to take forward. Thank you, Neve. Can I come to you about building momentum from this report? Um, sure, I, I would. I would echo. Um... Um, my colleagues, I think <clears throat> um, Steve made some incredibly important points, in particular around uh, where we are now in this in this in the sort of sequence of events. Uh, and um, I would echo absolutely um, uh, the way in which he so eloquently put how our young people have been uh, just tremendous through this whole um, pandemic, and also the difference between <clears throat> the way in which our politicians in England and Wales and perhaps our politicians here in Scotland reacted to that where our first minister uh, praised young people for for their both their resilience but also for stepping up um, and, and for keeping people safe. I think one of the areas as well and the cabinet secretary touched upon it um, where 
we were able to demonstrate um, Scotland as well as other parts of the United Kingdom and indeed other parts of the world where we, we could get beyond the boundaries and the barriers that usually stop us and slow us down um, and created in 10 months a vaccine that has transformed our abilities um, to try to get back to some sort of normal life with all of the caveats that that brings. And I was listening, I was very taken uh, last Monday, I was listening to um, uh, the Oxford team who uh, were receiving an award for the work that they had done. And one of the things that Professor Gilbert said, which was really um, striking was she said, you know, what we've shown, if we've shown nothing else, is that we've shown there are different models for doing things and different ways of getting things done. And we don't actually have to conform with the constraints that we've built for ourselves on how to do things. And similarly, um, in my own domain, in the criminal justice system, the, the way in which our judiciary, our prosecutors, defenders, our police forces, our forensic scientists adapted to change really quickly to try to maintain that that um, in the one sense normality, but wasn't normality, but it enabled the functions of the state to happen. And uh, again, it's I think it's something that um, that you might have said, Talat, in the, in the introduction, now that we're beginning to return to normal. But my question will be, well, are we? And what is normal? This gives us a huge opportunity to just reshift what that focus of normality is and again as i said in the in the justice system i don't see us going backwards now that we've embraced the digital world but what that means is that we need to understand how to build that future and it comes back to um things that we've already said how do we maintain that tremendous momentum that we had at the beginning and i think in part the cabinet secretary put, put his his um his his finger on the pulse and that is about communication about being ensuring that what we're saying is is both accurate and as much as possible reliable and to be honest to own the the or honest enough or brave enough indeed to own the 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 necessity to sometimes say do you know what we're going to need to change what our plans were and um, because something else has cropped up and something else needs to now be fed into the equation of what we're going to do next in terms of opening up our societies and so on. So gaining that trust, we had that at the beginning. I think without doubt, um, we had public trust at the, at the beginning of the pandemic because we all understood what we were being asked to do and we understood why we were being asked to do it. And bringing that trust back is, is critical, I think, to being able to, to really get the best from the circumstances that we've faced um, not just in this country, but globally over the last uh, nearly two years now. So we need to ensure that we keep that trust. And if we've lost it, we regain it. And I think everybody's got um, a voice in that, whether we're politicians, whether we're scientists, um, whether whether we, uh, whatever part of society we're working in, to ensure that our communication is clear, but that it's communication that communicates trust uh, as well as, 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 um, as information. Thank you so much, panel. Um, you've mentioned this, you've touched upon it, and there's also a question that's come in specifically about this. Um, but the Commission report um, highlighted the disproportionate negative impact on marginalised communities. So whether it is um, disabled people, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities, women, LGBT communities, working class communities, and the intersections in between um, have been disproportionately impacted. And it's not just the Commission, multiple reports have evidenced this. Um, how do we engage and ensure that their voices are better heard so that indecisions are fit for purpose? And it links to what Fiona has asked here, which is if disabled people had been listened to both at the beginning of the pandemic and over the last couple of decades, the response to this uh, crisis could have been so wildly different. And uh, she asks if that is part of the report and also what um, what what can we do about that in Scotland? Because clearly that conversation isn't happening. Um, that conversation is happening, but it's not being transformed into action and change for those marginalised communities. Uh, Neve, big question, but I'll come to you first. Sorry, just getting my mute to, to work. It is a big question, uh, and Fiona, thank you very much for for um, asking it. Um, I think, <coughs> excuse me, in in terms of uh, probably the domain of of um reference that i have that might be best is is both uh, talking about accessibility um 
uh, for marginalized groups, both in the area of justice, but also in the area of higher education. Um, and, and part of it is what you've exactly said, which is we absolutely must engage with the, with the people within these groups to understand what the issues are. Often, I think that engagement has only ever been one way, where we've, we've asked people to fill out uh, questionnaires or come to focus groups or you know, have those discussions with us. And then those of us who have asked for that information go away and don't ever come back. And so it, this, this is about having a proper conversation that is an engaged conversation, which means that we engage as much or both sides of that, of that debate and feel that they're being listened to, try to understand things from the lived experience of the other person. Um, because I don't think we do that particularly well uh, and enable a conversation to happen in a way that is different than the way it has happened before so that there isn't power imbalances so that there aren't aspects of those um of those groups that are that are speaking with others um that there aren't aspects where they just feel that they're not being heard so we need to find a mechanism for that to occur one of the things that we did do during the commission's work was we looked at different ways of engagement and we put public engagement through the heart of of often the work that we did where we looked at employing different mechanisms and methodologies we let we invited uh, people who don't usually sit in the chair seat to chair things. Um, we got involved with um, illustrators who created different types of infographics so that people could look at things from different perspectives. And while that was a start, it shows that firstly, we can do it. And secondly, it can be engaging. And thirdly, that it can involve this, this two way conversation. But there is such an enormous amount of work to be done here um, to, to try to ensure that uh, these voices that, that Fiona is talking about are, are heard. I probably have given a very superficial answer, I suspect, to that question. Um, but I think it's one where, where we really need to have a, a concerted, really hard think across the leadership of this country to, to determine how do we pay this more than lip service? Um, and how do we actually listen to, to the voices that people are asking us to listen to? Thank you, Amy. Stephen, can I come to you? Oh, Stephen, you're still on mute. I um, I expected that to happen at least once on the panel. That's fine. Oh, there we are. It's a different platform. They all have the thingy in different places. No, sorry, still on mute. I'm afraid. Oh, can you? No, hear I, can, me? I can. I can hear Stephen. Oh, okay. Great. okay. So I was just saying, so many platforms and the buttons are in different places. So, so I, I'm very slow in learning. So I. There have been many bad things about the pandemic, but there have been some pleasures. And, and one of the pleasures has been meeting some quite extraordinary people. And another group of people I think we don't celebrate enough are, are the civil servants who are doing amazing work behind the scenes. And uh, I've become involved in a number of groups. And one of the groups was precisely on trying to develop schemes for uh, community engagement. And the civil servants, I'm, I'm sure I'm not meant to, uh, uh, name names, but uh, but I will, and, and, and uh, I apologise if I'm breaking some sort of protocol. But I'm working with with Dorian Grove um, on, on those schemes has been. I mean, I've learned a massive amount from it. And the, the issue of community engagement, it's an easy soundbite. It's very difficult to do in practice because one of the problems, of course, is if you invite the community in, who is the community? And the danger is you get the usual suspects. You get the people who've got the time who are articulate and therefore are the privileged already. And how you make sure you get minorities involved is really difficult. And there's brilliant work going on. Um, and I hope to see the fruits of that work in due course. But let's not uh, underestimate the complexity of doing this and getting the people who are marginalized to be involved in these processes um, is in itself a real challenge. Um, the second thing I want to say is to me, one of the mis most egregious mistakes that was made early on in the pandemic um, at a UK level was when we had to have local measures and we called them restrictions and we called it lockdown. So in Leicester, if you remember, in the summer of 2020, we started talking about locking things down. Now, lockdown is something that's punitive. 
Lockdown is something you do to people who've done something wrong. We should have framed things and framed policies much more in terms of support. Because again, I go back to this point that the reason why you get large numbers of infections and flare up of infections is because people are exposed and they are exposed because on the whole, um, they are deprived. So how do you support them in every way that you can? Because the danger is that we created parts of the country in the UK, more in England, where there were high levels of infection, which were locked down, which were groups of minorities, and we pathologized them. Leicester lived under lockdown for over a year and felt deeply disgruntled by the fact that perpetually it was being treated um, as if they were a problem. So I, so I do think, and, and the discourse of the whole pandemic, and whenever people talk about uh, COVID measures as um, uh, COVID restrictions, I bridle. The media do it all the time. They say, how will people react to COVID restrictions. Actually, we should be talking much more about protections, about support, about giving people the resources they need to self-isolate if they're ill. And that's hard to do if you live in a multi-occupancy uh, house. Um, in fact, it's almost impossible to do, especially if you've got vulnerable uh, relatives. So I do think that we have framed the pandemic in the wrong way, and that creates even more problems. And the final point I will make, um, and I'll use a concrete illustration, um, is around community engagement. If you look at rates of vaccine hesitancy, they are higher amongst groups which historically have had problematic relations and low trust in government. So the last time I looked at the figures, actually overall levels of hesitancy, as opposed to people who haven't got around to get vaccinated, is fairly low. It's about 4%, at least it was 4% a month or so. Uh, back. <coughs> However, it is 12% amongst the most deprived. It is 14% um, amongst uh, religious minorities like Muslim groups. It's 21% uh, amongst uh, uh, black ethnic minorities. Okay. So these are groups with historically low levels of trust. It's not that people are stupid. It's not that people are backward in any way, but they have questions, um, genuine questions, and they have a history of actually medical interventions which weren't always for their own good. There was a big report, Joint UK House of Commons and Lords, um, which showed that over two thirds of black people consider that the NHS takes their concerns less seriously. So the answer to that for me is actually to engage with people, to show trust, um, to uh, work through members of the community, to go to the community, to make sure that you um, uh, translate materials. And when you do that work, that careful work, which is about answering general questions, not saying if you don't get vaccinated, you're selfish, or if you don't get vaccinated, you're stupid, but understanding that people have real questions and real concerns they want answered, uh, which I doubt many of us can answer if we weren't experts. Questions like, what if I have sickle cell uh, disease? How many black people were involved in the trials? What if I'm pregnant? There are answers to those questions, but you need to respect people and listen to them and go through those their communities. And when you do that work of building trust, rather than waving a stick at people and threatening them with sanctions and telling them they're fools, if you engage rather than alienate, it does work. It's, it, it, it's not glamorous. It's uh, meticulous, person by person, street by street work, but it has to be done and that has to be the priority. Thank you, Stephen. Hamza, um, Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf, can I come to you next? Yeah, th thanks again. I really thank both um, Professor McDade and Professor Riker for their comments, uh, you know, taking notes previously as they're, as they're speaking because there's so much in there uh, for us to make sure we don't, 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 don't lose sight of. You know, for me, um, creating the appropriate fora, so uh, social covenant steering groups, citizens assemblies, all of these uh, worthwhile initiatives, they are uh, extremely helpful policy-making uh, terms. So if I give you an example of the National Care Service, it would probably be the biggest public sector reform, uh, possibly in the history of devolution, but for quite a fair while. Um, you know, at, at inception stage, we've got a, a social covenant steering group, which is, you know, effectively people of you know, lived experience, and again, quite a diversity of lived experience from the care, children's care system, adult care system, social justice, 
the criminal justice, sorry, <coughs> social work, et cetera, et cetera, uh, coming together to, in, to, to really challenge us on that policy um, at, at, at inception stage. And, and I think it will be of, of great value to us. But instead of creating these groups, which again, I, I'm not dismissing the, worth, the value of them, they are hugely valuable, it would be so much better having people of you know, diverse background, and I mean that in the broadest possible sense, actually making decisions, being the policy makers and being representative of those who are policy makers. So, you know, <clears throat> I, 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 from a, from a, from a minority, a racial perspective, I'm, you know, the only uh, member of, 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 of government in the history of devolution that's ever been non-white. And so I'll bring a certain perspective. <clears throat> I don't think, though I could, I'm happy to be challenged on this, but I don't know if we've ever had somebody with a, a permanent disability, for example, uh, or permanent wheelchair user, but we, we can't have actually because the only permanent wheelchair user that's been elected has been uh, Pam Duncan Glancy, if, uh, who got elected in May this year. So, so you know, we, we, are, we are lacking a real diversity. I think we're probably more diverse as a government, and I mean this as governments in the devolution era, than perhaps... UK governments have been previously, but that's a pretty low bar to judge us ourselves by. So I think we, we've we got to do much more uh, if we want to ensure that the decisions we're making actually are not just reflective of the challenges that people face in the ground, uh, but actually when it comes to that building back better, as you, you, you referenced, tell it, that, that it's done in a way that is equal uh, and, and doesn't just um, embed the inequalities that existed within the system previously. Um, and, and, and making sure those people are at, not just at the table, but are the ones who are making decisions is going to be really important. And then just I referenced Pam Duncan Glancy in you know, I suppose my SNP conference, and a bit strange to be praising a Labour member, but just you know for the six months that she's been in Parliament, you can you can see how the Parliament and government, but certainly the Parliament, has become far more aware of issues that affect a permanent wheelchair user than in a way it just didn't do. You know, I've been a parliamentarian for uh, an elected parliament for 10 years and it's down to, you know, she's she's very, very good in, in a number of ways and, and she's excellent at articulating uh, the concerns that she has, but actually, you know, just the fact that she uh, is there at, at, at an important decision making, uh, in a decision making platform such as the Scottish Parliament that is important. So that, that's policymakers, but I think you could say that about every senior role uh, that exists in, in the Scottish society. And you touched upon the intersectionality. So, you know, that, that is hugely important. So uh, this is, 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 is it's, uh, an issue that uh, frustrates me because I think in Scotland, we're far too far behind where, where we should be in all of this. So uh, if we want to weed out those inequalities that exist, then we've got to make sure the people that is affecting our, I would hope, in, in, in policy making decisions, uh, decision positions, if not, then at least creating the structures where they can genuinely influence, not as a tick box here, you know, we've made the decision, you know, we'll just go out and do, you know, meet, do a round table with a few people with disabilities and ethnic minorities and, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll take off that box. It's, it's not the way we're going to make meaningful change. Um, and then, and, and, and then um, really, I suppose the last point is, uh, you know, I really struggle with this uh, in, in, in my own role is just balancing up those various different harms uh, and they're really challenging because you know, I met with a group of of uh, carers, and uh, you know they were they 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 were really uh, rightly so I think they were really hard on government and saying you know you have effectively opened up society okay you've got baseline mitigation measures in place etc cetera, etc cetera, but we are really fearful about the effects of you know two thousand two and a half thousand cases uh, a day. Um, of, of the virus and the, that community transmission at far too high a level and we feel like we're being ignored uh, and so there's a power of work for us to do you know that versus for example what Professor Riker and others have spoken about about the mental health impacts of protection measures and 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 and, and, and uh, you know and amongst children for example in particular and how we're balancing all of those things um, and, and and of course we'll have a public inquiry and I'll look at these things but I think for us um, you know, that for decision makers is a really, really difficult challenge in making sure we balance those various different harms. And we've tried to take that a four harm approach. I'm not saying we've always got it right, but it is again, being upfront about the logic of why we're doing things and hoping that people understand. Thank you very much to the panel. We're 
almost coming to the end, but I've got one more question and I'm hoping for a, a quick round of answers. And it's an important one, which is none of us have been involved in this commission to create a report and then, then for the report and recommendations to gather dust somewhere. It's also about implementation and to actually deliver change. But a lot of what we've talked about is um, requires infrastructure. It requires resourcing within Scotland as well. So a key question that I have is how can we be better prepared for future challenges? How can we also deliver the recommendations um, in the uh, in the report? And do we have the infrastructure in place in Scotland to deliver that? If not, what do we need? So first, I'm going to go to the Cabinet Secretary um, on this one. Yeah, thanks. I can be really short on that, which is to say, we're going to study the report in, in, in great detail. I think so many of the recommendations are very worthwhile. Uh, we might not take them up exactly in the in, in, in the form perhaps the report suggests, but I think it's absolutely the central key points around you know independent uh, advice, independent fact checking, public participation, you know, resilience of our infrastructure going forward. These are all points that, that I would struggle to, to to disagree with and think they would be very very worthwhile. I, I think I think um, priorities are going to be hugely important. So the DFM for us leads a piece of work where government ministers are working together across portfolio, uh, like we always have, but with a focus, I think, that he brings, uh, which is exceptionally helpful because um, the creation of the infrastructure is really important. Uh, it can't just be seen as a health, uh, the job for the health secretary or the job for public health to, 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 to do the pandemic. Uh, and this virus continues to affect every section of society. Um, and creating the infrastructure to make sure that we're building a solid foundation for the future is going to be a cross-government uh, challenge. Uh, finance infrastructure, uh, financing that infrastructure, uh, you, you need to give me another hour to, 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 to speak to that, on, on which we don't have. Um, you would be hardly surprised uh, at me making this point, particularly at SNP fringe, uh, which is having control over those resources would make my job and our job uh, markedly more easy. Uh, but given uh, that we are still within the confines of the United Kingdom, uh, where we have to really work uh, closely with other nations uh, of the UK, but particularly pressure the UK government into making sure the priorities um, uh, uh, priorities of recovering from the pandemic are not lost. Um, and that's a real worry for me. There's almost a feeling from some parts of the UK government that we're, we're, we're pretty much through this. Um, even if you looked at the la latest spending review, uh, just over nine billion over the spending review, review period for for COVID nineteen measures, that doesn't seem enough, uh, frankly, uh, given how much we've already uh, spent. So um, I will leave it there. But uh, a lot of good food for thought uh, in the report, which I look forward to, to getting into more detail. Well, next time we'll provide an hour just for how will the government implement all the recommendations. Noted. I'll do that next time. Um, Stephen, can I come to you? Um, do you think we've got the infrastructure in Scotland and how do we move from the report's uh, recommendations into actual implementation? Okay. So one of the things that has been remarkable through the pandemic, I think, is how we have changed into a knowledge-based society. I mean, all you know, people in their homes watching the TV are beginning to discuss things about spike proteins and the R rate and, and, and so on in a way that you'd have never dreamt before. And also in terms of behavioral science, people are thinking in terms of, of trust, social contract, adherence, all these issues, the things that used to be, you know, in the tutorial room are now out in society. And I think that's really valuable. And I think we've seen the power of a knowledge-based society and asking what that means in practice within government as well. I mean, the particular thing that interests me and pleases me is the recognition of the critical role of behavioral science and the way in which it is critical in the response, every bit as critical as the life science. And I think that has real implications for thinking about how that's organized within government uh, and, and, and uh, uh, between government, uh, the RSE and academia. And everything that is important in the last year or two will be even more important I, I, I'm sorry to be miserable just before Christmas, but in, in the even bigger crisis before us, which is the climate crisis. So I think we need to learn and learn quickly because otherwise we're in trouble. So, you know, it's like the old saying that, uh, you know, if you think his education is, in, is, is costly, think about the cost of ignorance. And when it comes to the climate crisis, the cost of ignorance will be the destruction of our species. So it's worth thinking about that. And the final point I will make is this. One of the things I like about this commission 
is it's not just a commission which tells everybody else what they need to do, it tells us what we need to do in the academic world. And I think some of the things we need to implement ourselves as a model to others, and we can't ask for money from others unless we do it ourselves, is to think about how we make ourselves open, how we make ac ourselves accessible, how we communicate, whether we put science communication in all our science courses. So let's show that we can do it, and then we're in a better position to ask others to do it. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Stephen. Can I finally come to you about next step yeah. in the infrastructure in Scotland? Uh, th thanks, Tom. I'll be, I'll be um, very brief. I, I, Steve stole my thunder there because I was going to talk about science communication as it's, it's, it's such a, a, a critical thing, I think, in terms of, again, going back and being able to have um, conversations about the what the science can tell us, where we get the data from, why we need that data, why it's so important to have it. Um, uh, and then to, to use that to generate um, scientific output and communicate it in a way that we can understand it and we can um, comprehend it ourselves so that we can rationalise why we need to do certain behaviours. I think I'll, I'll pick back up on, on the Cabinet Secretary's comments about, about um, uh, cross-sectorial and cross-government challenge. I think he's entirely correct. This isn't just one portfolio. This is across the whole of the portfolios of government and indeed of the third sector. But my plea would be, you know, when when um, some funding, if there is some funding that comes forward, is that it's not funding that's the same as we've done before, and particularly for the third sector. Giving third sector grants that are 12 months long isn't going to work, I would suggest, um, because it's it's such a short term funding pot that you spend half your time time trying to get the right person to do the job and then the next half of your time trying to get the next pot of money and so that type of funding the way in which we fund this if indeed the funding comes um i think needs to be um profoundly looked at so that we can really do something that has a longitudinal difference and creates that long-term um, change and shift in, in what we need to do um, as a society. Um, so, so working together on what the next steps are would involve, of course, government, it involves higher education, it involves the third sector, it involves both public and private uh, sectors, I think, as well. Um, in, hello, um, in, in, um, in, you know, in, 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 in reaching a conclusion to that journey, to that, where we are now in terms of working out the next steps. But it is something that we all have to work on together. And I echo Steve's comments about climate change. Excellent. Thank you to all the panel and our extra mini panellists. Welcome. Um, thank you to everybody. And thank you for those who have been uh, watching and participating. Just as a very quick summary, um, important things. And it's you know unsurprising that I'm taking, away, taking this away from it and highlighting it. But the importance of centering tackling inequalities, tackling systemic inequalities and the voices on genuine partnership of marginalised groups within how we make decisions in Scotland and just emphasising Fiona's point there, one of the um, audience members who has um, popped this into the chat function, of uh, there being parity of esteem in who, who is heard um, and specifically she was talking here about disabled people say, stating what was likely to happen, their experiences and it not being embedded as part of the decision making. Um, we can't pay lip service to this, as Stephen mentioned, it's complex but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It requires resourcing time, effort and prioritisation. Uh, we talked about building trust and we do that through honest, accessible public communication. Uh, we talked about intergenerational inequality, the importance of collective and community behaviour, not blame and division, but taking people with us on the decisions that we make. Um, and we also talked about the importance of the infrastructure and making this report as something that is not simply gathering dust on a shelf, um, um, but is actually implementing change so that we are better resilient, better prepared and a more equal society when facing future crises, um, whether that it, including the climate crisis that we are experiencing right here and right now. A huge thank you to the panellists, thank you to the RSE staff behind the scenes who make this happen. Can I just emphasise again that there's a little pinned uh, point at the top of the um, chat function where you can read the full commission report, uh, send it to others in a few months time, send it to your MSPs, maybe give them a reminder that this thing exists and we expect something from them. Um, but thank you very much indeed for listening and participating and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.
Bye, folks. Bye. Bye-bye.